Okay, so uh, like I said, we're going to review a little bit of the concept uh, last week. Last week we obviously talked about, or last lab we obviously talked about uh, doing man, uh, manual delay compensation and uh, all the artifacts that if you don't do it, what could happen. We're going to re review that a little bit today. Uh, then we're going to get into interfacing some outboard gear, maybe like some, uh, I've got some pedals here and uh, some other hardware processors, things like subharmonic stuff, how to use that and keep everything in phase. Uh, we'll even look at some plug-in server stuff today with Waves and maybe UAD. Uh, I know Dave Stagel brought up a point last week of uh, having a multiband compressor in line and not being able to get a, phase, a flat phase trace on it, um, even when it was in bypass. And I'll just let the cat out of the bag or give you the early punchline. That, that's what I experienced as well. Uh, but I'll give you a way to kind of deal with that and uh, move forward and, and still do your alignment. It doesn't really impact your ability to do the alignment. You just got to kind of know what you're looking for there. All right, so uh, maybe to start here, let's, uh, let's get this back down. Uh, we'll go here. So I, I took the liberty of making up some drawings and stuff for you guys and put it in a PowerPoint here. So... All of the stuff you're going to see in the small screen today or in the video screen here today, uh, I'm going to put up in the shareable Dropbox uh, or Google Drive in this case uh, in a PDF form. So you'll have all of these circuit diagrams or all these block diagrams available to you if you want to go back and review this. And try it on your console. I think at some point I'm going to clean up this show file a little bit and I'll also post the show file up there as well. If you want to load this show file on your S6L and play around with it, uh, you can do that. It'll have all these kind of lab experiments built into it. All you got to do is follow the patching or figure out the patching, and you should be okay. All right, sound good? Get some more people in here. Man, this is what happens when you have a lot of people show up. Holy cow. You can open these in an editor as well, don't you? Uh, say that again? You can open these files in an editor? The block diagrams? No, 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 the... the, the, the uh the console oh, the, sh the show file. Yeah, absolutely. You could open that up in standalone for sure. All right, so let's review our method here just a little bit. Uh, let's just go uh, back over this. Remember, if, we, uh, if we're going to do this, if we're going to use this approach of uh, getting a flat phase response uh, to represent it being in alignment with our reference, we want to bypass all of our processing, and that includes channel processing, right? So all EQ, all dynamics, all high pass, all low pass, through the entire path needs to be bypassed if you're going to do this alignment procedure. So hence the reason you would want to do it early in the process. Uh, second part is if you have channel delay already logged on your console, maybe you're doing some sort of an acoustic alignment, uh, et cetera, uh, oops, where, uh, you know, you're aligning two microphones or whatever, you want to take that out first, log it, and then you're going to put it back in when this process is done. And then finally, you're going to patch pink noise into every channel uh, that you're going to align here. So, and you just turn them on one at a time, adjust the time, and get the flat phase response. And you're off to the races, okay? So, uh, I've kind of redone the, the circuit diagram here a little bit. I'll blow this up a little bit bigger so you can see it for this. Uh, so, as you can see here, you got the reference on the left. Uh, I've just got that going through a matrix. Uh, as this goes on, I'm sure you're going to, uh, hopefully, going to kind of glom on to why I use a matrix to do this kind of work. Uh, it just makes it so easy to, at any time, measure a couple of sources uh, back to back. So uh, the ref is pink noise. This is internal pink noise on the console that we're using here. That's the internal generator. And that pink noise goes into our reference channel and also goes into what we believe will be our longest channel. And in my situation, on, on the show file, my snare drum was the longest path because uh, of it going into parallel compression paths as well as group, as well as a master left, right, and up to the matrix. So the idea there is just to discover your longest path. That's the first step. And then after that, uh, I, I add the little extra buffer to it. I think it's the smart thing to do so that you can actually change uh, the processing on your longest path if you want it. But you, the idea is there, you just keep a net time, right? So if my throughput on my longest channel, my insert on my longest channel is 184 samples, well, I just, if I'm going to change plugins in and out of that channel, I just need to make sure the net time remains 184 samples. And if you add some extra time to that channel, that gives you a little wiggle room in case you put one in that's longer or shorter than your other plugin. 
uh, and then use the FFD, FFT delay locator to discover how long that longest path is. And once you have that delay locator in place and you see that flat phase trace, don't change it from there. You want to hold on to that time. That's your reference time for your throughput on the console. The only time that would change is if you discovered a longer path that you would need to use as a reference, right? All right, so uh, after that, it's just a matter of aligning the remaining channels, right? So you would just go, uh, pink noise is still going into your reference, and then you just start turning on all the other channels, let them take their natural and complete path all the way to the output, uh, align for fat, flat phase, and you are off to the races, right? So uh, turn on all your shorter path link channels uh, and do them one at a time. You only want to do one at a time here. And... Uh, yeah, the key here is not to delay locate. I had somebody ask me this over the, the break, and yeah, you don't want to read de delay locate every time. You want to keep that original time and then just adjust time against that original time, right? Everybody follow me there? Remember, if you've got questions, please be sure and uh, just raise your hand with the little uh, raise hand mechanism, and I'll try to uh, show it up for you, all right? Uh, repeat the process, obviously, and you and remember, you want these path, uh, inputs taking their actual path to the output. Uh, and then after that, of course, re-engage all your processing, re-engage your internal EQs and filters, uh, your dynamics, any plug-in processing. Uh, don't, don't uninstantiate it, but just put it back in play, right? You want to uh, re-engage it, you want to take it out of bypass, and then you're off to the races. Hopefully, you're going to have a great event mixing after that. All right, so let's just go down some best practices here. So uh, one is, is somebody annotating on my screen? Uh, know what your console automatic delay compensation accounts for and what it does not account for, right? That's the one thing you have to understand if you're going to make an assessment on whether you're going to do any of this stuff is you've got to understand what your console's ADC does in the first place. Uh, in, this, in my situation where I'm doing... Um, you know, where I'm doing this alignment, I, I, like I said to you guys, I just turn it off. I, I just don't even deal with it. I, I know if I get all my input paths exiting the console at the same time, then I've achieved what ADC is going to do in any kind of abbreviated form anyway. Okay, so make sure you understand that it can take some, a little bit of playing around. As, as we all noted uh, in the, uh, the run-up to this, you know, there was so much misinformation on what the ADC does in venue you know, it's no wonder there was mistakes and, and all kinds of misconceptions about it, right? So you got to make sure you understand what it does and what it doesn't do. Uh, if you're unsure, and it's painful for me to say this because I make a console that's got a lot of pro uh, processing capabilities on it, but if you're unsure, try your best to avoid external inserts on your inputs. It's just, I mean, all the goodness that's going to come out of that really cool GUI plugin is going to be lost in the destruction of your mix impulse as it exits the console. So be careful there. Be really, really careful. Be very judicious in what you do there. Uh, if you're compensating manually, don't do this on a show day. Unless, I mean, unless you are really got your back against the wall, try to do it, try to pre-align and pre-build your show file somewhere. Uh, work from a template, which we're gonna have a, an, an entire lab uh, that I'm going to talk about how best kind of a best practices in terms of using a template, a pre-aligned template, but it is the solution to working fast here and working with a with a a good impulse off your console. Uh, make it yeah. So just make an attempt to work from a pre-compensated template. Uh, yeah, you got to stay aware of the entire throughput that you're creating here. Uh, you may end up creating a throughput on your console that is too long for your situation that you're going to be mixing in, whether it's a small club or it's a big arena, it can go both ways. You can, you can make a show file or a show, uh, a, I mean, a signal path that's too long for the actual application. So be, be careful of it, especially you guys that are mixing to video. Man, really be careful here. I mean, you could really throw things out of sync dramatically here and not have a path back. So, you know, do this with some, with some knowledge and some, uh, some competency here. Uh, as I try to tell everybody, please just use and tr figure out how to the basics of an FFT and learn how to use it to do this. You'll be, you'll just have such a better result because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen here over time. As you start to do this, your ears are going to get trained to hear it. And I, I got to the point after I started doing this, the first, it took me about a month of doing this, but after about a month, I could, 
I could hear, you know, one or two samples off in my drum kit. I, I could hear it in the cymbals, you know, the, the way the cymbals were adding together. So you'll hear it after a while. And so you want to get that kind of accuracy and that kind of resolution in your hearing. Uh, and of course, if you're delay compensating in a monitor console, man, please really be careful here. Uh, you know, choose, pick and choose where you're going to, uh, you know, where you're going to add throughput time here. I, obviously, on a vocal path, it's going to be almost, almost impossible to do. You know, I, we're already latent in the vocal path for people uh, that are singing anyway. So, you know, adding more time to that is going to be almost unbearable. So be careful there. But there, that said, are there places that I would delay compensate on a monitor console? Yeah. Yeah, there is. But you just got to be careful with it. Such or, as? Uh, well, such as if I was doing a lot of processing on my drums, then I would probably make sure that drum kit is aligned at the console level, right? That all the inputs were going up to the bus at the same time. Right. That would be the, that would be the main main one that I can think of there. Uh, and, you know, the irony of it is this, you know, uh, you know, if you're a drummer sitting at a drum kit and you end up adding another three or four milliseconds of latency latency to the signal that is hitting his ears, if he's in ear monitors, the kit probably sounds better to him now because of the propagation of drums getting to his ears and adding with the ear monitors. I mean, that's the situation where the ear monitors almost work against him because his sources are late to the ears. His acoustic sources are late to the ears. So a little bit of push in time there actually might help the sound of his drum kit in his ears, believe it or not. So remember, it's just propagation and latency there. Yeah. Does that make sense to you, whoever asked that? I'm going to guess yes. Thank you, Robert. Yeah. All right. Here's the uh, – actually, uh, before we get to this lab, I'll back up my PowerPoint once. Let's just review what this looks like. Because uh, I got a couple ways to show you this today. So I'm going to pull this up just a little bit bigger. All right, and we'll get on the overhead camera here. Oops, not that one. Actually, I'll take you to that first. So here's what we're going to. We're going to insert today, guys, or, or play with today. I've got a couple of subharmonic processors. I've got a Line 6 bass pod. Uh, I've got a, a pedal called the color box and another, I just grabbed a guitar distortion pedal out of the closet. Literally. I mean, it's a, uh, snarling dog distortion and talk about whether we want to use these as inserts. If not, if we want to use them as parallel paths, how do we get that all to work together properly? And what are some of the caveats of it? You know? Uh, so that's what we're going to mess with today. Let's see. I think we want to go to this one. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I've just uh, put together a really simple little drum kit here, right? I've got kick drum, snare drum, tom, and overhead. Uh, we're going to use two groups to do our parallel compression. Uh, I've got an alignment channel down console here that's in play, all right? So, of course, if I turn on one of these channels and we don't have delay compensation on, guess what's going to happen, right? And... I've got the impulse window up on smart now, so you can see it, right? So if you go here, and annotate it in here. If you're watching right here, you can see that we've got delay compensation off, and those two groups are arriving at the master bus, both late in terms of our delay locator, and both out of time, right? So that's the first thing we want to want to fix for sure. So uh, if I go back over to the console now and go to delay compensation, you can see delay compensation is off. And when I turn it on, our noise comes back and those two imp impulses align, right? So at least the two groups are in alignment now. Everybody with me? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and delay locate that. All right, so there's our impulse right in the center there, which is good. But now I, I'm going to just turn on all of these inputs. And notice they all stay to the impulse, right? Everybody is, is all good right now. Everything's good in terms of phase right now. But let's... Uh, sorry, I've got a late comer here.
Uh, so now I'm going to go to the plugin window, and notice I've got a, re uh, a set of plugins here that are on these in inserts, but they're all not instantiated right now. I've taken them completely out of path right now. All right? Everybody follow me there? So kick snare hat or kick snare tom and overhead. There are plugins ready to be instantiated, but they are not right now. And as we can see in our window, we've got delay locator, or I mean, uh, delay compensation in place. We have a good impulse coming off the console right now. So now I'm going to go start instantiating plugins on this and watch what happens. Right? So now our impulses are all over the shop, right? And this is because of those plugins. I'm actually going to put this in play too. Let's, let's get really cool here. Okay, so obviously, you know, we don't want all of those, we don't want our kick, snare, tom, and overhead to be exiting the console at, at different times, right? So we've got to go in and fix this now. So the way we do this, obviously, is find the longest path, and we're going to take a good guess that our longest path, again, is the snare drum. So as you can see here, I've got actually a hardware insert on it by a Matty. I've got a UAD plugin inserted by a Matty, and then four other plugins uh, associated with this for a total throughput time of 311 samples. I know that's going to be tough for you guys to see there, probably on a small screen, but I'll annotate it. So that's right here. All right, that's telling me that time. So I, I'm just going to, I mean, I know that's the longest time right now. So what we want to do now is delay locate that time, right? So I'm going to turn off the other channels, right? And as you can see, that channel is now late to our original delay locator, right? Remember, it was in time when it didn't have the plugins on it. And remember, we've got delay, uh, delay compensation turned on right now, and it's not accounting for anything that's happening on the input side. So I'm going to relocate. All right, so now we're going to look at those other channels against that, right? So I'm going to turn off my snare now, turn on the kick drum, and look, it's early, right, which is where it should be. all these annotations. And we're going to start delaying it now. So I'm going to put in the delay and I'm going to start moving it to so get it there. And we want to work toward a flat phase trace. This is going to be about three seven, eight. Voila. Okay. Everybody grabbing that there? I mean, it's just that simple, and it's just rinse, lather, repeat for all other channels, right? We're going to basically delay all the channels back to our longest path in this sense, in this time, which is the snare drum. And now we can we can be very assured that all inputs are leaving the console at the same time, right? We'll stop there for some questions. Anybody got anything you want to see, talk about there? Sean Sullivan, go. Um. This, you might get into this a little later because you were talking about external like UAD and that kind of stuff. Um, let's say you're entirely manually delay compensating your console, not relying on the desk to do any. Would you align your groups first with like the time adjuster plugin or would you just add more time to say your base inputs because it doesn't have any inserts on the group that they're routed to? Say you're using all groups. Yeah, I'll tell you why I always do it at the input and not at the groups. Be and, it's, and you're going to see this in play as we come up here. The reason is because if I take those inputs now and I want to push them up into auxiliaries, I want them to be in phase, right? If I have maybe, you know, maybe all my bass stuff that I have at the input side, maybe I got bass guitar sitting at the input side here. If I don't align those at the input stage and send them up to the aux with the drums, into the aux, maybe for the subs, they're out of time of each other, right? I want right. Them to so the time adjuster plugin will just cause you issues because it's adding time instead of it being at the input. 
Right, right. Now, is there a place where I might want to do it at the group level? There is, and I don't want to jump too far ahead here because uh, I want to cover this at some point as well. But if, if you're one of the guys, like I do this, I think you do it, Sean. Uh, and I know Paul Hager, a few other engineers do this, where they will break out their master left, right from their vocal groups. They'll break them apart. Their, their vocal subgroups will not be assigned to their master left, right, so they can re-add them together back at the matrix. That's a situation where I will usually... I, I can see putting group delay on there to get it to align back with the mate, the mix, you know, the, the mix left, right. Yeah. See, I'm using external summing and I'm bringing multiple stereo paths back to the desk. Yeah. In that situation. Yeah. I, I don't, I mean, unless you're, uh, let me think about that in that situation. If you're adding processing to it externally to those paths, then yeah, I would probably align those paths there at the group level. But anything input-wise, I would I would do anything as input inserts. I would certainly do at the input stage. Does that answer your question there? Yeah, I mean, I was just trying to confirm that the the time adjuster plugin is very specific and not for anything that you're doing on the groups. It's only for external kind of routings and those extra bits that you're not going to get covered anyway else. Let, let me ask you this on your insert: Do you? Uh, how are you getting in and out of the console there? Are you doing it by? Are you? I mean, I'm it? using MADI to uh, MADI to analog converter, and then that goes into a Neve summing amp that gets then converted back to MADI and back into the desk as in, as groups. The analog stuff, like there's, I'm doing some parallel stuff in the summing amp, but there's obviously no latency there because it's in the analog. So it's just you know it's an insert send on like say my drum group. So I'm doing parallel drum stuff only in the anal analog instance and not on the desk itself in the digital. Right, right. Uh, well, so the I, compensation is already done because of the MADI, you know, the MADI to analog and back to uh, MADI. That time is already accounted for basically. Yeah, I think I would just be concerned if you, if, if you're doing that on all of your groups, then, then peace, yeah. I yeah. am, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the only thing that would shift my thinking there would be if you added processing in the external domain, then I would want to realign those groups before they got back to me. But it, but if it was added via an analog circuit, that wouldn't affect anything time-wise. Yeah, that's correct. Only only digital there. So yeah, yeah. Good question though. Solid man. All right. Uh, any other questions there? Glad to clarify anything you need to clarify there before we move on, because it gets a little uh, trickier from here on out. All right. Uh, all right, let's move on to our next example here, uh, which is, uh, nope, we're not quite there yet. So I'm going to go back to here. Stand by. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's talk about the issue that Dave Stegel brought up last week, uh, which is this. Get there. I'm going to go ahead and turn that off for now. Uh, so he was asking about uh, what happens uh, when you have multiband anything multiband, whether it's multiband equalization, multiband compression, whatever. Come on. So he was asking what happens uh, with multiband compression because uh, he was experiencing with wave C6 where it was leaving the crossover points in play, uh, even if it was in bypass. And, uh, you know, so I just thought I would put together a couple scenarios with that just so we could look at it. So the first thing I've got for you is the McDSP and the, uh, the Avid multiband uh, stacked together here. 
So uh, let's take a look at what that looks like. It actually works out all right. So Yeah, we're just in between the samples there. Stand by. Okay, so as you can see there, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, in bypass, the, uh, it's not affecting uh, the throughput or the phase of the unit. But if we look at uh, the waves one, it does. So let's go over there. That is this guy. So if we take a look at C4, that is on a separate channel here. And obviously we can see a different throughput time here. Oh, maybe I, maybe I lied. Maybe C4 does do it as well. Yeah, looks like it is going to do it. So you can see that, you know, this is crossover messing with phase here. Even though we've delay located it, uh, you know, same thing is in play there. So um, we know the impulse is happening at the right spot. Our alignment on the computer looks good. Uh, but phase is all out of whack here. And that's as a result of the crossover points. Why they, why they have it going like this, I do not know. Uh, I may reach out to them and see what they say about it. Uh, or is it this one? You know what? Let me do this. Let me see if it's the six doing this. Let me take this out for a second. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I take back what I said. That's the C4. And as you can see, that's out of circuit, right? I've got the in out button out. Uh, I've got the in out button on the uh, on the plug-in rack itself out. I'll annotate it here just to get, make sure you're looking at it correctly. So notice in out is out there and out there, but we do have it instantiated and it's, and it's good there. But now if we go do the same thing for C6, let's see what happens here. So I'm going to uninstantiate that and I'll just reinstantiate C6. Let's see what happens. Out of circuit. And yeah, there we go. So as you can see in C6 here, Out of circuit, out of circuit, but yet we get all this crossover business in there. So the, the moral of the story is this. Look, if you have the C6 in place, uh, you're going to, and it's, and let's, let's say, let's take the bigger example. It's, it's in your longest path. Then this is what your initial trace is going to look like, right? But if we want to measure something against that now, all we've got to do is match the time, right? So I'm going to turn on another plug-in here. This is the, this is basically those Avid plugins, and I'm going to treat this as we're going to align this to it. Actually, I can't do it because that's later. <laughs> Let me get another channel up here. Uh, stand by. Let's do this. So I've just just brought up an empty channel. It's got some noise in it, and we would we're going to delay it to get it in time with that C6 channel.
right? So even though the C6 was our reference, right, was our, it just becomes our time reference, we're still going to go for flat phase there to make sure that our additional channels are in time with it. Now, where this would get tricky would be going the other direction, right, where you had already established a, a, a pathway and we're going to align a C6 channel to it, right, then you're not going to get a flat phase trace for the C6 alignment. You're going to, you're going to get that crossed over trace looking thing. It's going to be a little bit of a challenge, but you want to make sure and watch impulse there and get it as close as you can. Maybe, maybe in that situation, I would probably be interesting to do it, probably do some uh, uh, pink noise cancellation and see if I could make it go crazy there, you know, or make it cancel, uh, cancel all the way out there. Follow me there? Everybody with me there? Yeah, that's an odd one. I'm, I'm going to reach out to Waves and see if they got an answer for me on that. I don't know why that's doing that. What's your thought that the, the the crossover is not being bypassed entirely, or what would cause that if it's if it's bypassed and out of circuit? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, you tell me. I, I don't see any paths or any ways that that path can be in play there, but clearly something is. Something's messing with time. Some of the Waves plugins are not hardware bypassed. Yeah, that's that appears to be the case here, whatever it is. All right, so let's see. Where are we then? Is everybody okay with that? I hope Dave Stagel's on. I hope he got some confirmation on what he's Yeah, I'm here. I I think, you know, the, the thing about the multibands, too, just in general, that I'm always cautioning guys is you want to watch it because if you start running them in parallel, I mean, even if we – get our impulses aligned here that's going to help with the overall mix but if you start running them in parallel on something like maybe you've got your snare drum and on your your parallel drum compression or drum smash whatever you're doing if you put a a multi-band plug-in on there you just put a bunch of phase wraps in your parallel and that might not necessarily combine i think one of the places that bit me years back was trying to use max bass <laughs> which is another Waves plugin yeah. for, uh, on a, a drum parallel, and that's another one that has there's a crossover built into it. Yeah. So we're we're gonna me you know anytime we're messing with phase, we're messing with time. So yeah, well, well, actually, I'm not I don't have Max Bass here to do it, but I actually got some other things that we're gonna simulate that are similar to that, just so you can get a sense of what that is like here. Okay. All right, let's move on to our next thing. Like I said, we got a lot to cover today. We're gonna, I may not get through all of it here. So uh, let's go, yeah. All right, so let's talk about um, using an instrument pedal outside of the desk. And I, I, people are always surprised how often I do this. There's actually some really good ones to do this. And I'm gonna show you one today uh, where we're gonna parallel process a vocal outside kind of with outside processing on the console. This is an analog processor that I got back here. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up here so you can see it. Oops. Are you not working? You should work. So I get my camera world in order here. There we go. So on this little stack of goodies here, um, I've got, uh, we're going to talk about this box right here. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it's called the color box, the color box. And I actually use this uh, for a very specific thing on vocals. Um, so, uh, but I use it in a parallel path, right? So I'm, I'm going to take it, I'm going to go out of the console in some way, return it back to the console and use it as addition to my original vocal sound. And you can kind of see that here in the, um, in the drawing, right? So uh, just kind of take you around it here. Can you guys see my cursor there? Yes. Okay. So uh, in this situation, it can either be a, a direct output or, or a line up or uh, um, to however you want to do it, but you've got to go. You've got to go out to the box. You're going to go through A to D conversion here, obviously, and we're going to create a bridge channel. So I'm going to go out to the box. I'm also going to go out to a plugin in order to create the bridge and return it to its own channel. Okay. 
then the return of the box is going to come to a third channel here. Now, the cool thing about the color box is it's got line input and line output on it. So you don't have to do any kind of uh, conversion to instrument level or any of that kind of stuff. It can actually handle uh, line input. Uh, so that makes it really easy to use in this situation. But the key here is that we've got to create an alignment bridge here, right? You've got to get used to this idea of how we do this currently in today's technology. Will we come up with a way to, to do this easier? I'm sure we will over time, but right now this is the answer. So much like we do in our, uh, like in our parallel processing, et cetera, this source channel of vocals is not going to be assigned anywhere, right? But it, the bridged version of it is going to be assigned to our master bus, it, whether it's a vocal subgroup or the left-right bus, however you're doing it. That's going to be the assignment path. And then the return of the color box is going to get added with it, and we're going to work on the alignment of these two items, right? Let me uh, do this just to make reinforce it here. So the critical port part of this is this, where we're going to align this portion right here, right? That's the important part that we want to get aligned. So uh, let's take a look at it here. Let's do this. This, there we go. So here's my vocal channel, my actual vocal channel. Here's the bridge, and here's going to be the color return. Now, I, I use this kind of just as a, almost as an exciter for a vocal. If you guys, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this trick. I, it, this was a very popular trick in the 80s and the, and parts of the 90s. You guys still do it today. I actually took this out on the road with me at one point, uh, where you take a Dolby processor. I was using a 301, and you encode the vocal into the, uh, with the Dolby, but you take out the low process card. So it's only Dolbyizing the high frequency element of the vocal and then return it and add it with the vocal. It just puts this incredible kind of air and presence on the vocal. We can kind of simulate that with the color box. That's kind of what I, I do here. But obviously the first thing we want to do is get our two channels in alignment, right? So first thing we're going to do, pull this back forward. It's going to all see smart there. We're going to uh, align our bridge channel. So I just got some noise running through there right now. And we're going to we're going to delay locate our bridge channel. So it's there. Oops, I got some processing on that too. Apparently. No. About here. Yeah. So you can see I had some equalization on the vocal itself there that I want to take off. All right. So that's our delay time. Now we want to, uh, and actually I did this backwards. I'm sorry. I want to delay, they, ugh, delay locate the longest time, right, which will be the color box. So let's go ahead and hit that. Oh, I think I probably already got them in time. Yeah. Okay, so this is a situation where delay, you know, bypassing the box doesn't really help you here. You've got to get some sense of what's going to work in time. And we're really concentrating on high frequency here. So I've delay located like, like it is right now. And you can see that that's going to work pretty good for our delay locate. Uh, now we want to look at the bridge channel against it. And you can see that it's early. So we've got to delay it back in time to get those two channels in time. And... 120 samples there to do it. So now these two things are leaving the console at the same time, meaning they will add together correctly, right? They will work together really well. So we're going to get off the noise here and actually go ahead and listen to this. With some vocal. And then discuss one other little issue here. All right, so here's the vocal without it. I used to take the long way round. Let me know if that's blaringly loud or anything. But now my sides are set up. All right, so now I'm going to add in the color. You taught me how to climb and now I'm reaching for the You can see it just gives it a really cool presence and gets it forward. 
right? Now let's take the time off of that bridge channel and see what how, what the impact would be. You can hear just comb filters to death. You, it would never add together correctly there, right? So back to time in. Everybody follow me there? Now, here's the tricky part if you're going to do this on something like a vocal, right? Especially if you're going to take this color channel and send it to effects, which in this situation I want to do, right? I, if I'm going to go to a reverb or a chorus or something, I want that to go there. Well, if I send signal from my primary vocal channel and this channel, they are out of time in the aux bus going to the effect, right? So if, we, if we're concerned about that, which we should be, really what we want to do is send these two channels to the effect, not from here, right? So this always drives the, the argument a little bit of, well, okay, which channel should I have on the top layer? Should I have all three of these available? Really, I only need one or the other of these. Should it be this one or this one? And for me, if I'm, if I'm doing it this way, I'll actually move this channel to the bottom layer and have this be my, my primary vocal channel. Now remember though, this mic or this, this fader does not contain the mic pre, right? It only contains the sends up to the bus, right? But you need to do that if you want them to do this. So the way I've got this where I can show the difference here, uh, which I think you'll get, is I've got some effect for it here. We're going to listen to that effect sending either this or this plus this, right, plus this. We're going to do it either way so you can listen to the comb filtered effect going into the effects processor. So let's play her again. Let me get some balance on this. So I just got some stereo pitch shift on her. So the idea is do we want to send this or this along with this to that pitch shift? Make sure I got it here. All right, so I'm just going to do some, uh, let me switch to this view. Okay, so this is the original vocal. This is the, uh, the bridge vocal going there, okay? So I'll try to do this and tell you which one is which. Right now, the bridge vocal is going there. I'll let an entire vocal pass go through there and then switch it, okay? I'll try to shut up. You taught me how to climb and now I'm reaching for the top. I used to Here's take the long way round when the mountain was too tall. But now my sights are set upon the highest peak of all. Yuck. You taught me how to climb and now I'm reaching for the top. I used to take the long way round when the mountain was too tall. But now my sights are set upon the highest peak of all. Is that reading for you guys there? I can hear that big time here. I, I don't mind telling you. I hope it's making it across the net that way. Everybody still there? Yeah, uh, I think I did. Yeah, I could definitely hear it. I'm hearing quite a bit of the processing. Uh, yeah, it's it's weird, and it's I, I really probably should have pulled up some reverbs that might help it a little bit. Uh, that when this was going on, and I didn't realize it, that was the the tip off for me was all you know my reverb sounds were just so dark. I was like, why is there no mid range in my reverb? It was because the two sources that I was sending to it were canceling all the mid range was canceling out in it, and that's why. So if those two are added together properly, right? If these two are added together properly in the bus, then your effects processing is going to sound right as well. You follow me there? That's why, you know, we want to do all this alignment at the input side because once we get it going up into auxes, we want it to be adding together there as well. Yeah. All right. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, it does. So get used to this concept of a bridge channel. Uh, it's your path to doing all kinds of stuff like this. You're going to see this go on a bunch here. So let's move on to the next example. My goodness, we're already at 2.30.
All right, so the next one we're going to go to is uh, using uh, a distortion pedal as an insert or as uh, a parallel path, right? Uh, and again, this is really common to do. I mean, we do this all the time in the studio, and we need to be able to do this live uh, to be able to kind of simulate some of the stuff that's being done in the studio and get the same kind of process. So obviously, if you're going to insert a distortion pedal, on the channel and it's a hardware distortion pedal like I got back here. The only thing you have to be careful there of is with distortion pedals, I've seen this happen so many times, whether I'm using it in this example or somebody is using it on stage, if the, if the distortion pedal is in bypass, a lot of times the polarity will flip on it or vice versa. When you put it in, it will flip the polarity of it. So you got to be very, very aware of it, right? And, and you know, we kind of get into, uh, if you're going to use them external as an insert, you get into kind of a, you get backed into a little bit of a corner here. Because uh, if you want to bypass it, where do I do it? Well, I, I can't really go to the hardware bypass on, uh, let, let's say I'm bringing it in through, you know, a hardware insert on my console because now I've changed the throughput time, right? So, you know, where do I change it? You've just got to be really aware of the polarity of it when it changes. You'll see it here in play. Uh, I'm not going to give you an example of insert today, but I'll show you the same thing using it as a drum uh, adder here. So just keep that in mind, right? If you're going to actually do the hardware insert, you got to do it. The other piece of it that you want to keep in mind in terms of getting level and sensitivity correct is notice that I'm using a reamp plus a DI here. So let me get back and I'll explain that. If you guys are not familiar with this, uh, you need to be. So the key to interfacing this is using the right interface tools, right? So the, for the output side, we need to take console output and get it to instrument level. Remember, that pedal is going to be expecting a, a guitar to be plugged into it. And then on the output, we need to take instrument level and get it back to mic level, which we'll do with the DI, right? So if you can't do these two things, I'm going to suggest that you don't do this, all right? You'll never get the level sorted out correctly. It will never sound right to you, et cetera. All right, so please make sure and do this. There are a few people that make reamps. Um, John Cuniberti, I think, still makes his reamp. That's the ones I'm using here today. I know Radial makes a, a, a reamp box to be able to do this to convert from line level to instrument level. But please make sure you use those boxes if you're going to do it this way, okay? All right, so but for our example today, we're going to create a little adder here, uh, a little parallel adder using a, a drum pedal. So in this situation, uh, this, uh, some of the guys that have been following some of my work and you know been out to my shows and stuff, they see me do things like this. I, I always have this channel uh, that's part of my drum sound that's called Goo, G-O-O. And it's an additional parallel path that I use to add texture or depth or whatever I want to do, probably usually more often than not, it's just the snare drum that I'm trying to do it to. Uh, but it can be the whole kit as well at times. It's just another create a parallel path for it. So in this situation today, I'm going to use uh, a distortion pedal in conjunction with four plugins. So as you see here, I'm going to take, and you can take either an aux or a direct out of your of your console. So in the situation today, I'm going to take a direct out of the snare. I'm not necessarily going to use an aux bus, I don't think. Or did I? No, I actually used an aux. Okay, so we could add other channels to it if we wanted to do it. But we're going to focus primarily on snare drum today. So auxiliary out to the pedal. Return the pedal to a channel, right? And that's going to be uh, our goo channel. And then the goo channel is going to get added in with your other drums. So in, my, in our situation, at least in my situation, all my drums that are processed, meaning kicks, snare, and toms, go through parallel compression. So there's a dry version, a parallel processed version that goes to a drum subgroup. This is just another parallel path, so it gets assigned directly to the drum subgroup. You don't want to take this and send it to your parallel path as well, because you'll never get the whole thing aligned if you do it for one. So we're going to align this third return path with our kick, snare, and toms, and our processed kick, snare, and toms. All three of those are going to be in alignment, and then when we add it together with the original snare, it's all going to be golden, all right? Everybody follow that. If you've got questions, please ask it now. All right, so this is using the Snarling Dog uh, pedal, and this wouldn't necessarily be my first choice for doing this. Like I said, I just grabbed the first thing I saw, uh, but that's what we're going to do here. So obviously what we got to do 
uh, in this situation, the goo channel is going to be the longest path, right? So we're going to have to delay locate that first. So let's do that. And see here. Yeah. So don't worry about the little bit of the phase there. I've got the pedal in play. Uh, but now that I've got it aligned, watch this. Let's see if it changes here. Yeah. So all I did was hardware bypass. I hit the bypass pedal button on the pedal, and look at what it did to polarity. Right? It's 180 degrees out now. Right? So that's a challenge with this, for sure. Right? So that's back in. Now we want to make sure our kick, snare, and toms and our processing channels are aligned with that. So we'll do this now. And clearly they are not. Oh, wait a minute. Let's just double check something here. Yeah. Is that longer? That shouldn't be longer. Stand by to stand by. I made an incorrect assessment. Okay, now we're going to align our kick, snare, and toms to that. This is our bridge channel that we're aligning here. Oops. Now we're going to take and align our process channel. This is our drum spank. Okay, so now we've got um, so now we've got kick snare and tom bridge, kick snare and tom's processed spank, plus the goo channel. So we should be able to have them all on, and no change in impulse, except for that it gets bigger. All right, so you can see that in smart there. All right, so now we're going to take and turn the noise off and actually play some drum and see what this sounds like. Now remember, actually I'll show you this before we do that. On that goo channel, right, I've got a lot of processing available to me on there. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to use it all at once. And, and when I do this, I don't use it all at once. I just use varied parts of it. So on that channel, in terms of actual uh, software inserts, I've got uh, tape saturation, I've got lo-fi, I've got uh, mod delay. Now, like if I wanted to create some reggae stuff, I might just be able to go dot, 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 dot with this one fader, right? I can create some, some uh, reggae stuff. And then I've got reverb that I can put on there. And in this situation, this is blended reverb, right? So I'm taking source and blending it with reverb and can add any one of these things at any point just to add some character or texture to the snare drum. Right, so, but in this situation, we're going to start just with trying to make this really kind of small snare sound a little bigger. All right, so let's do this. Let's go here, and I think if I hit this, you should hear this snare drum. Everybody hear that okay? Let me get the stream up a little bit here. Yeah, sounds good. All right, so we got the snare drum up here. And now I've got some distorted snare that I'm going to add with it here, just to kind of get some bigger width out of it. Let's 
All right, so that's just the pedal return being added with it. Now, if your first inclination is to think, well, God, that sounds distorted and all kind of ratty, inside the music, it's, you're not going to hear it. It just gets bigger and brighter and fatter. You know, this is very analogous to using tape distortion or tape saturation on, on an input where, you know, you kind of solo it up and think, ooh, I don't know. And then you hear it in with music and you go, oh, yeah, I want more of that, please, right? So I'll just turn it on and off without me talking so you can kind of hear it. Then if we add some tape saturation to this, and maybe just a little bit of reverb, so we go from small thing to bigger thing, right? But the point of all this is that it's got to be in phase. Their impulse has to be leaving the console at the same time if you're going to pull this off. Otherwise, the cancellation is just going to be so crazy, it's not going to sound right or good at all. Everybody with me? I see another guest here. I'm going to let him in. I can't believe there's a guest showing up an hour later. Questions? Concerns? You're an awfully quiet bunch today, although I haven't been following the... Haven't been following the chat very much. I do see one question, whether the reverb is mono or stereo. It can be either. In this situation, it's a mono reverb. If you're going to do it in stereo, then you just create a stereo channel and duplicate the uh, guitar pedal return into both channels. Okay, Stereo is a good option there, if you, especially if you're going to be doing any kind of panning effects or if you want some wide reverb on it. It's no problem. You can, it's easily done. All right, let's, uh, where are we at here? 2.30. All right, yeah, we'll keep going here. All right, let's carry on. Let's go to our next example here. And this one has to do with bass guitar and using bass modelers. All right, this is a really interesting topic. So let's go here. So in this situation, I'm using Line 6. Uh, I've used this thing on the road and in shows for ages. I, I just love this thing. Uh, but it's tricky. Uh, you, you've got to be... Uh, you know, kind of careful how you use it. So given that it's an amp modeler, I treat it just as if it was an amplifier. And, and in this situation, I'm not going to create it as a parallel path. I'm going to create it as a duplicate path. So in this situation, I got the DI coming in. And if I was going to mic his cabinet, it would come in on its own input, right? Well, that's the same thing here. If I'm going to use the modeler, it's going to come in on the same or on a separate input. So I'm going to have an input for DI and input for modeler but they're both going to share the same DI signal, as you can see here. So uh, I'm just literally patching. I'll show you the patch here so you can see it. Uh, just patching the DI into both channels. So let's see here. Inputs. There we go. So this comes from here. So you can see the noise, uh, which in this situation would be the DI, right? It's coming into the DI. And then for the line six, uh, line six here, whoops, it's this one, sorry. Line six, it's got the same, uh, same signal. So you're going to have one preamp for both pieces of this, okay? Uh, but you want to go... Uh, in this situation, we're going to insert that line six unit right on that second channel, right? So it's going to represent the, the modeled version of the DI. It's going to be, represent your speaker cabinet and amplifier. So we've got to have the hardware insert in there. As you can see, I do over here, right up on the... Over there. can see that we've got the hardware insert on it. That's the line six inserted on that second channel. Now, a kind of a cool thing that happens with uh, modelers like this is they will give you a DI output as well. So the question becomes, well, which am I better using? The source DI here, the source DI, or the output of the modeler that is a DI? Which one am I better off using? And, you know, I would make that assessment based on time. But here's the tricky part with the modelers. The modeler's throughput changes depending on what preset you're on, depending on how much processing they had to use to create the model. So 
this channel, which is your modeler in terms of throughput, is a moving target. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to kind of get some sense. I mean, I would just pre-measure them. If I've got three or four presets that I'm going to use, I've got to know what time to put into play on either one of these channels to get them in time with each other. Otherwise, otherwise I'm never going to be able to use the DI and the cabinet. If I'm in a situation there where I, I can't manage that, I'm probably just going to use the cabinet and not even use the DI. Right. If I if this becomes problematic in terms of keeping track of the alignment of the two, you're going to have enough trouble keeping this aligned to the rest of your mix if you're changing presets all over the place. Huh? And I'll, I'll prove it to you. All right. So in this situation, we are going to take a look at the throughput on the model. And I'm just going to put it in tube preamp right now. No, no big processing. We'll just do this and take a look at it. And what's the first thing you notice, right? It's out of polarity, right? Very interesting. So we go to reverse polarity there and get it back in line. Now the other part of it that's the challenge here is you can't bypass the processing on it, right? There's no way to do that on the actual unit to bypass the processing on it, I don't believe. Yeah, I was just checking, I, I don't remember the being one. Yeah, well, if you guys know differently, tell me. All right, so we've got our time now uh, that we want to align this to. Let's take a look at the DI. Remember this, this uh, line six signal is not post this signal. They're just running in parallel. They both have the same input. We're just processing one of them differently. So let's take a look at this in comparison. And we can see that it's a little bit out of time. Okay, so those two signals are in time now. They should add up together. And we can see that they do. The magnitude trace is getting bigger as I add them together. All right, but let's take a look at the Line 6 DI. Let's take a look at its version and see what it's doing in terms of time. And yeah, it's, it's a little out of time too, right? It's not by much, it's probably just a couple of samples, which may or may not be meaningful to it. But you know, the, the point there being, that might be a better choice of your DI as opposed to your actual DI. You'll just have to play it by ear which one you want. Either way, they should all add together correctly. All right, so now let's take a look at the throughput. I'm just gonna turn up the line six and let's change presets a little bit and watch what happens to impulse here. You can see that one's way later. All right, so <laughs> my advice to you is pick one and roll with it, or uh, you know maybe pick one amp model and then just edit it as needed, or you're gonna have to really kind of figure out what the times are for each one of these presets so you can adjust accordingly. Right? Pain in the butt, for sure, but worth it right? for bass guitar. Bass guitar, probably one of the hardest instruments to do live, and so you don't need anything te tearing it apart before it gets to the PA. Right? So I'm going to go back. Let's just go here. Maybe here. This is one of the presets I really like. All right, so I'm going to realign this here. and then get our DI signal with it.
Okay. All right, so let's go listen to some bass guitar with that now. All right, so I'll give you a little audition of each one. So this is just the original DI. Sounds very DI-ish. That's the DI, that's the mic. And this is the Line 6 DI. Now we could check our two DIs there and see how how in alignment they are just by reversing polarity on one, right? And see, it's not perfect there. So you want to pick which one you want. But let's talk about adding DI and modeled signal, right? So now I'm going to take out the delay on the DI signal. Yikes. It's all the low mid content goes completely away there. Getting the idea there, fellas? Questions on that one? So you're just treating that modeler as its own amplifier and cabinet and microphone there. And the concept is to get it in time with the DI, right, before you add them together. If not, just pick one. Uh, pick one or the other. All right. I'm going to just browse the text here. Let's see. Or the chat. Yeah. I, I won't be able to deal with your chats today, guys. I'm sorry. I'll, maybe I'll try to address some of these questions with you offline on email if I see something that's really uh, sticky looking in the chat. But I've got a lot, to, a lot of stuff to cover here yet. All right, so that's using a modeler. You know, if you're using a guitar modeler, same sort of thing, you know. Uh, very much like trying to use guitar DI and a microphoned version of a cabinet, you know, there's going to be a phase offset there. The DI is obviously going to be earlier, and if you just put some really subtle delay in that DI, it'll actually add with that amp sound better, you know. Uh, that's not uncommon to do that at all. That's a, that's a version of what we're doing here. But if you're trying to add modelers with microphone versions of the same cabinet, etc. Man, you're in for a world of hurt there. It is really, really hard to do. Uh, I, I've never successfully done it. I've never believed what I was hearing in terms of phase and, and actual addition of the, of the sources. So be very careful there. Be very wary of what you do there. Uh, Sean Sullivan, go. So if you have multiple, let's go back to your vocal thing that you were doing a, a minute ago with uh, the color box, right? Yeah. Say you have multiple parallel things that you want to do with that. You would just find whichever one was the longest. Say one was an external insert that you had like your little stomp box and one's a plug-in path. That's several plugins. So that's obviously the longest one probably. So you would just align your duplicate channel, add the delay to that to match the longest one and then delay the return of say your stomp box thing to make it match the two, correct? If, if the delay of that stomp box was early, yeah. Right. So whichever's the longest, obviously, your duplicate channel that you're sending off to these things, you would make that delay match the longest path of whatever your parallel path is. And then the rest right. of them, the returns from them would just get added delay to them if they were quicker. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. 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 And in any of these multiple delay paths, that's what you want to do. And, and keep in mind, you can, you can be a little judicious here. I mean, if I'm taking a vocal out to a delay or a vocal out to purely a reverb, I don't really need to worry about aligning those channels unless I'm mixing on those channels. If I'm mixing delay and source on those returns, then they've got to be in time, right? Otherwise, you're gonna, that, that dry source in the reverb or that dry source in the delay path is going to comb filter against your, your original vocal, right? So, you know, use them all wet there in that situation. In my situation with the drum where I had a reverb inserted on that path, you know, that I was blending there. So it has to be in time with that source. If I was not blending the dry source in that, then all bets are off. Who cares really, right? Good? Yeah, I'm thinking more like what, you know, what I do typically is I'll have like a parallel path with like a little Aphex exciter on it. Yeah. And then I'll do another one with um, – an old school trick of using like uh, the 
Poltec EQ where you take all the low end out, boost a bunch of high end, send it to an LA 2A, cr- crush the shit out of it, you know, the top end of it, and then take another Poltec EQ and put the low end back and take the high end back out. So you get this really, <laughs> really obnoxious, like saturated high frequency and add that to it as well. And yeah. those two paths are always quite different, you know, the the three plugins versus the one plugin. Sure, sure. And, and to me, that's, I mean, you want to go to those extremes, that's totally cool as long as you impulse align the thing. As long as you bring it back to an analog impulse simulation there, you'll get away with it. You can do all kinds of stuff like that, right? So, yeah, yeah, go for it. All right, where do we go from here? My, my goodness. Let's go to here. Like I said, all of these drawings will be available to you guys. So if you want to use them, by all means, go right ahead and play with it. All right, let's talk about some subharmonic stuff. This always gets really interesting here. Uh, and I just want to check and make sure that we're okay with everybody. I think we're, we're about an hour and 40 minutes in. We'll call it an hour and 30 minutes in with the, the goof up at the top. Uh, everybody okay to stick around? We've got a couple of more demonstrations and we'll go. So. Yeah, man. All right, sounds good. All right, so let's talk subharmonic. Uh, and there's a few different ways you can use subharmonic processors here. Uh, again, one is as an insert plus a sub boost, uh, which is totally cool to do. And, you know, I've done this kind of situation on an actual bass guitar before uh, where I wanted to have a little more control over the sub path for the bass. So in that situation, if we look, if we go here on the console, I have, this would be my source channel, right? Maybe this is bass guitar, right? But I'll take an actual subharmonic processor. Like I, I, I just got one here. This is a little Behringer unit. Funny enough, this is a little Behringer base fix, but it actually works really good for this. I, I've used it in this very situation before with great impact and great success. So if this was my bass DI or my bass guitar, either one, I, I would just insert this processor on there, okay? And it's going to create a little bit of a crossover for you and a subshelf for you to add it together. So check it out on Smart, what happens here. So uh, first thing we've got to do is get it aligned with it. Right, now, don't worry about that bottom phase there. That's part of the crossover that's happening there. So you, the first thing you should notice is that on my signal, it's actually got a crossover point built into there, right? It's actually rolled off the bottom end. So, you know, everything, everything below 60 there would be rolled off in that original channel when this is inserted. But the other output that happens with the Behringer unit is the sub output, right? And it's going to have a harmonic content to it if you want to add it to it. So the second output comes from the, the sub output of the same unit. So let's take a look at what that looks like, right? So if I add that in there, that's going to be this part of the signal. All right, so now if I add both together, turn this down just a little bit so we can talk about it. Right. You can see they come up perfectly in phase, and I have control control over the sub component of the bass guitar on a fader. Right? This actually works really good. It's amazing how good this works. Then, if you want to add harmonic content to it, you just start to see all the you can see all the phase and the coherence start to go a little squirrely down in the very bottom. That's sub harmonic stuff that's being added to the bass. But you can kind of reshelve your base here and just do this. Now, you would obviously want to, in this situation, you want to take both of these faders and send them to the same master. So if you've got a, a subgroup that is just bass guitar, make sure and send them both there. You don't want to potentially get these out of alignment somewhere or send them to two different paths. Uh, but in this situation, you could also then take just this sub channel and send it up to the sub aux, right? Now, this is just the subcomponent of your of your bass guitar plus subwoofer, right? It works amazingly well. But stupid little unit, but it works great for this. Everybody ready to get me there? So this is insert plus a sub adder, right? Don't really have to do much there in terms of uh, uh, A to D conversion, uh, time alignment, anything like that, but it comes together pretty quickly.
Okay. Any questions on that one? So that's you're saying that's just an insert on that channel and not a separate return, or it is a separate return. Well, the I'm gonna I'm gonna put the insert back in play here. So that's the insert on the channel. See the frequency response of it. Yeah. So if I was to bypass that. Should come back together there. Yeah. Right, so that's what the base DI would look like normally, right? But with this inserted on there, then it actually does some crossover for it. Right, so it's rolling off bottom end, but that bottom end shows up on another fader over here. Right, so there's another output from that unit that comes back to its own channel. Yeah, it's an insert plus a sub output. And the sub output contains the harmonics in it if you want to add them to it. Right? Works great. The Behringer box being used is called Bass Fex. It's old. <laughs> this, this box I have here. I, I think I got this from Uli, man, late 80s maybe. And he kind of custom built the outputs for me. I mean, it's got, you know, balanced outputs and all kinds of other stuff for it. I, I have no idea what he's got in his line today that would simulate this. But, you know, you could do exactly the same thing here with the DBX120X. If you want Because it, it's got a subharmonic output on it. It's got a crossover output on it as well. Uh, you could do exactly the same thing with the DBX unit. You're going to see that next, but in, in a different scenario. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next one. All right. So this is subharmonic plus parallel here. So let's go to here. All right. So this is this is where things start to get a little uh, not tricky, but you know you just want to be you want to do things kind of the right way here and and give yourself the best chance for success, right? So in this situation, I, I believe I am taking this out. Let me just double check me here. Yeah, so this is our source channel. This is our source channel. So this could be any channel, right? It could be bass drum, bass guitar, whatever. And we're going to send it up to an auxiliary and then out to the DBX unit and return it. Okay, we're only going to take a sub return here. So this is actually assigned somewhere. Right? We don't have a bridge in play here. Uh, this, we're going to send this out. This, like I said, this is bass drum or bass guitar, and then we're going to add the subwoofer component to it. Okay? So let's take a look at what's going on there. So first thing we'll do is delay locate. All right, so just to let you know what I got in play here, this is our source channel. This is the auxiliary master. This is the sub return. This is the DBX sub return, right? So let's see what happens here. And as you can see, we've got a little bit of comfort right now. Now, with this, you know, you kind of got to outsmart things here, right? So, let's see, have I got this set up right? Let me think about this for a second. I gotta think about my own lab here. Right, so in this situation, I, I probably am not going to add this with the bass guitar to my master bus, all right? Because uh, for one, they're out of time with each other, right? They're a little bit out of whack here. And we might wanna deal with that here. But notice where it crosses over, right? The first cancellation is happening at 200 hertz. So really, we're only talking about subwoofer information here. Wait, do we really have to worry about that cancellation? Matter of fact, that cancellation might help us a little bit. You know, Nothing wrong with it being there. But if we wanted to be really down to brass tacks, we would do a bridge channel and align this. But here's, here's what I, the point I want to get across to you, is that you have the choice now of where you want to add this to your original signal. You can add it at your master bus, but I caution you against that because it's gonna eat up headroom like crazy, right? Uh, the place that I've done this in the past is actually take this directly to the matrix. 
So remember, in your matrix, if you've got a matrix driving your PA system, you're going to have the left-right master bus going there. Well, now you're going to take a direct output of this sub-return and send it there as well if you want to add it to the left-right of the PA. Right? Now it's coming out of the left-right of your PA. It may not make sense to do that if you're crossed over in your PA system to a subwoofer system. Right? It's going to go up there and eat up a ton of headroom but actually the PA is crossed over to keep these frequencies out of it, right? So you don't necessarily want to do it there. Where you want to take it is to your subwoofer drive, right? Take it directly up into the subwoofer matrix. So now you have a matrix driving left, right to your main PA, and you have a matrix or whatever your output's going to be driving the subwoofer system that has this return in it, right? And this can add along with your other instrumentation, right? If it's an auxiliary that's driving your subwoofers, we'll take that aux to the matrix and add this return to it. Now you got all this sub and harmonic energy just going to the subwoofers, and you can blend it really effectively here. Now the other cool place that this can work is in your record matrix. Like if you're doing a recording of a two-track, etc., and you want to add this to it, because this can make your recordings sound really, really good, nice and fat. Just add it in as needed to your record matrix as well. Just got to remember, it's probably it's probably going to go up post fader there, so be careful. You know, you'll be mixing to it. Uh, I would probably prefer it that way, but keep in mind that's what you, what you're going to need to do there, right? So it's really good stuff here. So don't, like I said, don't get fooled into thinking you need to add this to your master left right bus uh, to get it to the recording. I would add it to the recording matrix. Do it there so it doesn't eat up all the headroom on your left right bus. Is that making sense to anybody? I'm, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit there. But oh, it makes perfect sense. Works really, really good. And you're going to see the next situation where you actually have to do it that way uh, to do the alignment. Because the, the cool part about this is if you do it this way, right, if you do it this way where you push it up to the matrix, you can then, you know, put a little bit of delay time on your left-right bus and get these two things in alignment, right? You can actually do some, you know, I, I put a time delay, or, you know, um, uh, time adjuster on my left right bus just to be able to realign left right and my sub drive sources at the matrix, right? So it, it works really, really good if you do this. So the and next- Since most PAs are full range nowadays, it makes perfect sense to keep it out of the, the PA send. Well, it, I'll, I, I mean, I'll go against that a little bit. If the PA itself is running full range, then it can make sense to do this. But if it's crossed over to a sub system, then it really doesn't make sense to, to send it to the PA system. But I mean, if you've got a PA system that's running full range and you're adding a sub shelf to it, which I, just my personal taste, I, I hate that when I'm doing that, but I, I, I probably would never do that. In that situation, you might get away with sending it up. It's probably causing as much problem as it's solving. So you're, you're gonna have all kinds of arrival time differences there throughout the room. You know? That'd be my take on it. All right, so let's take a look at what we might want to do, similar sort of thing, uh, if Rob, we're... Yeah, go ahead. Hey, maybe I misunderstood, but when you were talking about doing this with the, with the bass effects, and you were sending that subharmonic directly to subs, won't, doesn't that take it right back out of alignment because you're not aligning it uh, uh, group-wise anymore? For the base specs ones, I'm not taking that sub return to the subs. That one's going to the bus, the same bus as the, the source. Because it's an insert. So if it was inserted on bass guitar and I got a sub return that comes with it, that sub return goes to the same master bus as the bass guitar. All right. I thought you had said you could send, you know, just the sub uh, the sub part to your sub send, you know, and that sounded like you were bypassing the group. I, if Sorry. I'm doing it there, I'm sending it through the aux, not directly to the matrix. So in that situation, if I was sending bass guitar to the subwoofers, I would also want to send that sub return to the subwoofers as well, up, up gotcha. into the auxiliary. All right, gotcha. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, because there they're aligned, right? Then, right? then they both arrive at the subs or the PA at the same time. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so let's take a look at one more example of this. Obviously, we're using a hardware box here to do it here. Uh, let's take a look at what we might want to do with a plug-in there, right? So I've got the subharmonic plug-in up here. Let's see what it looks like. 
All right. So you're going to have a similar situation here uh, with the subharmonic plugin. Now, the, the deal with the subharmonic plugin is it's really latent. You know, I mean, this is something that's going to be crazy, crazy latent. Let's see if I can find it here. There it is. But you, the thing you want to be careful with with these plugin versions of subharmonic is you don't want to mix signals here, right? This wants to be a completely wet signal, right? This is the amount of direct signal that's in the processor itself. This is the amount of the signal you're sending to it. And then obviously these are the different sub frequencies, subharmonic frequencies that you're going to add to it. Right? Let's some more level to it here. So you can start to see what's happening there. Obviously, I'm sending this directly to the same bus, I think. It's going to right. Let me just check something there. Oops. So obviously in the plugin, you can choose what harmonics you're going to send uh, out with this thing. You can choose uh, 40, 60, you know, different pairs, 60, 90, uh, 80, 120, 120, 180, and then just have control over each one of those that are sending to it. So it's actually really great. But the thing that I find with it is that I can't, there is no way I can actually add it to the master bus. Like if I want to add it to my left, right. Uh, I, I by the time I get the left right pushed all the way back to it, it's too long to use in the room. I, I'm, my PA is arriving later than the on stage sources. Uh, so the way I do it is just run it off of an aux and then take this return directly up into my sub matrix. Right? So this is just additional sub energy going to the subs. Uh, again, it's driven through the auxes, all the sources that are going to go to it, meaning bass drums, snare drums, tom toms, and bass guitar. I've aligned all of those things so I know their phase is good getting to it. I've just got to then make sure that this return and the PA system are in phase, right? So you can you can definitely do it. I, I, I It took me a lot of practice to get, find a way that would work with this, uh, but that's what I that's the way I do it. So take it for what's worth. Yeah, Matt, you still got your hand up? You got another question on that? Yeah, I or, do. Um, whether we're talking about the one time or the ESP version, you're sending that from aux right to the matrix, and then you also have the plugin instance going there as well. How are you compensating for uh, the latency difference between those two, or is it automatically being taken care of in delay compensation? It is that, you know, that's a really good question. That might be accounted for in compensation. Uh, right, that was just what I was might. thinking. Of. Same thing with the, the base one, you know, bypassing it when you your times. Yeah. You know, but I was just wondering, like, when you get to the matrix and you have multiple oxes or multiple return paths all summing together, how are you getting those things to? I, I would say that you could do this for sure. If you, like, it, I, at least this is the approach that I would take because I don't use automatic delay compensation. You could delay that aux that is arriving at the matrix to catch up with the sub plugin return. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. And that, that remember that requires a time adjuster in S6L land. Uh, that is. Uh, you know, you can't use the actual delay on the auxiliary that shows up on the channel because that's directed at the hardware output. You actually have to put a plug in on there if you're going to address it at the matrix. Sure. Okay. You follow me there? Yeah. Anybody's head spinning? Everybody okay? I know these are, these are juicy, aren't they? All problems that we really didn't have to worry about with, uh, <laughs> with analog. I'm going back to an XL4. I know, right? I know, I know. But, you know, I, I will say this. The amazing part of this is when you deal with this and get this right, man, I'm just, I'm just telling you, I'm going to say something controversial here, man. Digital sounds freaking great when you get the impulse sorted out on a console. There, I said yeah, it. Yeah, like I said on the last one, I think part of this is why a lot of people go, I hate digital consoles because they don't know this stuff. And they don't know that it needs to be done. And when you turn them up without compensating for this stuff, they do sound pretty bad. Oh, it does. It sounds horrid. 
in my opinion, horrid. No, but it goes back to what you were saying a couple episodes ago, that we're in terms of live technology, we're really far behind compared to digital consoles, to say the studio age. Yeah. I remember still going back and seeing, or hearing it rather, uh, an Oxford console from the first time in 2001. Um, you know, having come, in, you know, come having done at that point live sound for a good 15 years, I thought I'd heard really nice systems and it blew me away and I wanted to get to that sound. And going back to live sound after that, it was, you know, very eye-opening. Right, right. I, I mean, the thing is, and I, we all have to really, really understand this, there are enough time offset and multiple source problems happening in live sound already. We don't need to be sending 96 more of them to the PA system, right? We, we've got to get this part of it really sorted out before we even start judging any of those other, you know, acoustic offsets and PA offsets. I mean, if you don't get this part sorted out right, good luck getting, like getting the Crappy sounding arenas. We got all these different things that make it really hard to do the job. And then you have a desk that doesn't help you do anything at all. You have to, I mean, it does, but as far as inputs go and that kind of, you know, delay compensation, you're on your own. Yeah. And I'll just say this. I saw this come up a little bit in the chat. And, you know, what are we, three hours in now? And I'll say this. Everybody's got to realize that this is not specific to S6L. This is, this is for every digital console out there that yeah, incorporates sure. any kind of external uh-huh. insert processing. Okay? If it's baked in on the console, meaning it's built into the console, it's probably already accounted for. But if you're going out to any kind of server, any kind of, card, any kind of DSP card, et cetera, and coming back for insert processing, this is in play. This is absolutely in play. I mean, the only one that, that deals with this, you know, completely uh, is Waves LV1, right? But that's all Waves plugins. And the minute you go out to any anything else within that Waves environment, especially digitally, it's not going to handle that delay compensation, right? That's a one-trick pony there. So I, I commend them on it. I mean, it's fantastic. I, the, the first times I've heard LV1, you know, using their processing, using their model, as long as you stay in that box, it sounds fantastic. Not the funnest thing to operate, in my humble opinion, but in terms of sound quality, fantastic. So no problem. All right. Is that enough for everybody for Monday? Man, what a start to the week. Yeah. I think everybody's head's exploding right now. Yeah. Mine included. Well, it's, you know, as I've said many, many times, and I preach this at all my clinics and mixing seminars, if you are a sound engineer, Danny, I'll come to you with your question. Just a second. Hang in there. If you're a sound engineer in the modern age right now, and you don't have your head wrapped around how to use FFT in its most basic form, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. A lot of these things are going to trip you up. You're going to, you have a lot of landmines sitting out there waiting for you. So I encourage you to get your hands and your head around an FFT and start practicing with this. You can do all kinds of practicing with this at home. You, know, you could practice with things like this on the, you know, the most fundamental console and get the concept down. So, uh, but I, I also make this promise to you. I make this pledge to you. When you do this and you start getting your head around what's going on, it's going to change how you hear things. You are all of a sudden going to start to hear all of the time offsets that happen in live sound. You're going to become acutely aware of them uh, and they may just drive you to the point of insanity but you know the idea is okay i can hear all of these let me fix the ones i can fix and then let's go to work on the bigger ones right so y- you've got to get your heads around this uh, because i'm just i'm going to say this automatic delay compensation dealing with input inserts for every path combination that we could possibly make in live sound is not going to happen anytime soon but if it does come it's going to become in chunks you know, where you can, you could, you know, they'll, they'll do it kind of like, you guys remember delay groups, like in waves, I think UAD did this for a while, where you could have groups of inputs that would time align, you know, we'll, we'll probably, that's going to be probably the first step that we make into this, into digital consoles. But that in no way guarantees that all inputs are exiting the console at the same time. It only guarantees that groups of inputs are exiting the console at the same time. Now, is that an improvement over what we got? Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is, and we'll take it. But don't go to sleep on it thinking that solved the problem. It has not solved the problem. It's just reduced it. Okay? Be aware. Yeah. Danny Munoz, go. Robert, have you used um, uh, parallel phasing effects on the whole kit or the mix um, like, or as ways to use this whole thing creatively? 
Um, are you talking about the Are you talking about the Waves uh, pol- uh, the Waves phase plugin? No, no. I, I mean, you know those old even tied units. The the I think it was called a instant phaser. You know, like the Tama records have that a lot. Like you know, they they throw a phaser effect on the whole kit for a moment of the song. Sure. Or sure. you know things like that. Have you tried that uh, before in shows? Oh sure, many many oh, times, sure. many times. Yeah. How did you go about that? Uh, there's two ways uh, you can do it. There's two ways you can do it. Uh, mute your uh, mic mute there, because I can hear myself back through your speakers. There you go. Uh, there's there's a couple ways you can do it. I, the times I've done it in analog, I've always had a, a parallel path where I you know I would just take uh, an auxiliary or something to get all the drums to that phaser, and then use that phaser as a return and just push it up and and flange or phase the drums. You could certainly do it that way. Uh, the other way is to actually do it as an insert on the group and use a blender, you know, whether you want it to be all phase or, you, you know, really to get the most effective flanging or phasing sound, you need the source in there plus the late arriving one that creates all the modulation and the flange. So if you just go to just flange return, the, the effect on it, ironically is not as dramatic. So you need both sources to get them to kind of rub together and create the flange. So I think the return path is the better way to do it. Um, Ironically, if you do that on, con- on digital console, by the time you get out and get the return back to the console, it's almost too late to make it flange sometimes, you know. I mean, if you get out into that two, three millisecond range, it turns more into chorusing, and, you know, starts heading more toward chorusing than flanging. So, uh, you know, you want to, in those situations, I would probably use a plug-in so I could stay within the console. But I, again, I would do it as a parallel return there, Okay. Uh, Ken in New York, go, man. Ken in NYC, yeah, go, man. Hey, uh, do you notice that if you are using your FFT and you're using it on the solo bus versus an actual matrix output, if there's a different delay time? Yeah, I I mean, I personally would never use it on uh, a solo bus to do FFT anyway, because... primarily because I delay my solo bus back to the PA system, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, I probably would never use FFT off of a solo bus. Uh, unless you want to look at RTA. I mean, RTA off the solo bus makes more sense to me than FFT to some degree. So, Cause you got to have, you know, a, a reference and a measure at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Anybody else? I'll, I'll stay here for a little bit and answer some questions. We'll, we'll stay to the bottom half of the hour. We'll make this the longest lab in the history of labs here. It's going to be awesome. But where do you guys got to go, really? Where are you going to head out to? You're not going anywhere. Let's just sit and talk stuff. Right oh, out of we, have a, we have a protest to go to. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Keep your spacing. Do you see that parking lot where they had the protest the other day? Where was it? It was overseas yeah, somewhere. I, <laughs> I loved it. As long as you bring your mask to your protest. There you go. Yeah, please do that. Please do that. Yeah, we're good with all Biden people in Ireland here, so no nonsense here. Well, guys, like I said, I'll uh, clean up the show file a little bit, and I'll post it in the Dropbox or in the Google Drive, and I'll also put up the PDF of this PowerPoint, which has all of these uh, drawings and the the best practices things, etc. Uh, and you know chew on this until next week. Uh, we, we may get off of this a little bit next week. We'll, pr- we'll probably review again, make sure and, you know, check it all out. And if you want to come back with some, some pointed questions with this, I'll leave this show file up. I'll leave this stuff up in case we need to review anything uh, and go over it again. So uh, get out there and practice with this, do all this kind of stuff. It, it matters. It matters. Trust me. It really, really matters. Uh, we're going to get out there. We're going to come back and sound better than we ever sound when we come back, right? All right, fellas, I'm going to pull the ripcord here. It is 3.17, we, uh, three hours and 17 minutes later. Holy cow, just incredible. Uh, I, I promise all of the labs will not go this long, but I knew that delay compensation, especially manual delay compensation, was going to be really long ones. So, guys, I'll see you uh, next week. Uh, look Thank for you, Rob. That was really cool. My pleasure. Thanks. Look Thanks, for an Steve. email on the, that'll have the link to the folder with the new stuff in it, and we'll see you guys throughout the week. If you want to come by Wednesday, I'm on another webinar Wednesday for Avid. We're going to talk about the unified platform and what that means. That's a, a really cool topic. I urge you to come and check that out. It won't be three hours, I promise you. It will be about 30 minutes on that one probably. All right. We'll see you guys. Be good. Take care. Thanks.
Thanks again, Robert. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Robert.